Things to Come is a 1936 release science fiction directed by William Cameron Menzies. It was written by H.G. Wells uh, based on his book called The Shape of Things to Come, which was sort of a look at what he thought was going to happen in the world over the next sort of century. The story starts in 1940, basically finds the world on the brink of war. Of course, in reality, the world was already at war by 1940. And we start in a town called Everytown, which looks a little bit like London. So, yes, Christmas, which is one of the reasons we're doing it, actually, because we're doing Christmas movies. Happy Christmas. It's war. To be honest, the, the opening of the film is, is a little bit odd. It's got, like, people singing Christmas carols. It's got lots of, you know, Christmas decorations everywhere. But at the same time, you've got all these sort of newspaper sellers with, you know, posters saying war and, think, you know, all these horrible stories uh, that, that war is imminent while everyone is kind of going about their business and ignoring it. It kind of reminded me of Threads, actually, that we did quite a while ago in, in that, you know, everyone's kind of just going about their business while in the background there's lots of horrifying news stories about the imminent war. Anyway, so war breaks out and then the story kind of jumps forward several years and we see, you know, a montage of footage of tanks and, you know, the, this every town is pretty much bombed to oblivion we see one of the characters we saw earlier he's that now a pilot and he shoots down an enemy plane then it jumps forward a bit more we're back in every town the enemy have dropped this sort of this gas which causes this uh, this illness called the wandering sickness they don't really explain quite what it is but it means that the anyone who's infected with it wanders around and then you know if they get close enough to anyone else then they get infected as well you know war has obviously already wiped out a lot of people and then this disease caused by this gas wipes out even more and then it jumps forward a little bit more and we see we see this every town is, is now sort of there is a community there and it's sort of ruled over by this chief who's warring with a, with a nearby um, tribe should we say but elsewhere in the world other people have you know managed to to carry on and, and the film, the theme of the film is kind of progress. The pilot that we see earlier in the film is part of this venture called Wings Over the World, and they've built loads of planes, and they're trying to create a, a you know a better society that's free of war. So he try, you know, he's flying around trying to stop these tribes from forming and, and warring with each other. That's sort of the main part of the film that you know we stay with every town in that. I think it's 1970 that part is set in. The war I think ends in the 60s, doesn't it? So it's you know it's a long war. The world is, you know, pretty much ruined. You know, these guys are trying to trying to rebuild it. These wings over the world. We spend about half an hour or so of the film in this this middle section um, in every town with this warlord chief. It does eventually go further into the future. You stole my thunder there. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine because I I often when I'm watching the film I often think how uh, you do the plot how am I going to go come into my section and when I was watching the film I was like God this is so like threads. And I was like, that's how I'll start. And you and I, and I looked online, I kind of, I, I researched, I basically chucked into Google things to come and threads to see if anyone else had made that link. And I was like, I think I'm the only one. And you made it as well. So uh, <laughs> We're just mentally linked. Obviously. Mentally linked, obviously, yeah. Um, but I think, I think it definitely, there were moments that it, it felt, because it's not, it's quite an odd one, this. I mean, obviously, the, it's 1930s film, this one. But obviously, you know, the, the films were made that had plots in that yes. period. But this one doesn't, <laughs> It's quite loose, plot-wise, isn't it? You've got Ralph Richardson in there, who's a kind of a great classic British film actor, and Raymond Massey, who's very famous around that period as well. He was in films like Matter of Life and Death. The plot, there is a plot, but it's very loose. It's a little bit all over the place at times. So it kind of feels, has this kind of documentary vibe at times. There's lots of, a little bit. Lots of montages... Lots of footage of things, lots of familiar things. I mean, obviously, this was just, bef well, a few years before the Second World War started. But there are, you know, you've got people out on the streets with, you know, newspaper boards saying war is coming. Which, if you look at pictures of the, the uh, late 30s, early 40s, that's what, you know, that's that's how they uh, advertise the news, you know, with these big billboards and, and, and people would walk around wearing billboards as well. So it feels very familiar. It feels kind of like a documentary. And in that regard, it, to me, it felt like Threads because Threads 2 doesn't really have much of a plot to speak of and it's a lot of kind of documentary feeling footage. And then even like, you know, when in this film, when the, when the bombs go off, when a kind of air raid happens, you know, there's buildings exploding. There's a cinema that kind of goes... Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, again, feels very much like Threads. And I did wonder if maybe... They took any inspiration from this, yeah. Yeah, they took any inspiration from it because there's certainly things in here that felt a lot like 
especially when the bomb hit Sheffield in, in threads, a lot like when the bombs hit London. Well, it's not, it's not supposed to be London, but it, it clearly is London. I mean, it's clearly this film is, is known for its visuals. Obviously, you've got all the things I've just spoken about, but then, of course, all the stuff in the future. H.G. Wells himself was a bit of a prophet. <laughs> you know, he could always... He, he was always so good at... I mean, a lot of science fiction writers are. I watched an interview with um, the writer Christopher Frayling, and he made a really interesting point about how a lot of science fiction films aren't necessarily about the future. They are about the year that the, that film is made in. They're talking about the politics and the philosophies and the things that are going on in that time. But occasionally they will put things in those films that predict a reality that does come true. It's quite amazing to look at. I mean, it's quite metropolis at times. And there's a lot of miniature work, isn't there, which is which is, you know, a lot of that's pretty good. Yeah, there's some great miniature stuff done. A lot of it looks like the war films that were going to come in, say, 10, 15, you know, after the Second World War, you know, all the planes going through the sky. Well, apparently um, Hitler loved the look of the bombed city so much that he, he ordered that it would be shown to all his subordinates. Amazing. <laughs> He said, "This is what we're aiming for. This is what we're gonna. This is what we're gonna do." <laughs> I'd never seen this film before, actually. I had. Uh, it's one I'd heard about. We. It's Christmas, so well, it's not Christmas yet, but we are going to do a month of kind of Christmas tinged films. So this one starts with. It's not a Christmas film, clearly. No, <laughs> uh, it's not a very happy film either. But uh, it does start in uh, in Christmas, nineteen forty. It came into my thinking again a while ago because I was watching Ben Weekly in the Criterion film closet and he talks about it in there uh, as it, it being quite an early film that he remembered watching on TV many you know when he was younger it's it's pretty good i mean it's it feels old it feels the future stuff although you know there's a there's an amazing shot in there when they're in the future and and they're looking at a TV and it obviously looks like a widescreen TV flat TV which which feels maybe a bit ahead of its time or is it i mean you know if you think about they had cinema and they did have TVs at that point as well so it's not that far off uh, from the stretch of the imagination to do something like that. But then the costumes always look... They seem to be inspired by sort of Roman times yeah. in the future, didn't they? <laughs> it's a bit weird. There's lots of films now where we have caught up with when they're set. We've caught up with Judgment Day, uh, which is why in, in Terminator films they have to keep changing when Judgment Day was. Back to the Future 2, we caught up with that. But yeah, we've gone past Back to the Future 2 yeah. and Blade Runner, we've caught up with when you know Blade Runner was set. I mean, this, you know, the final, you know, the, 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 the future we get to is 2036, so we're not quite there yet. I can't see that the future will look like it does in, in, uh, in the film. No science fiction film is ever going to get it quite right, particularly when they're predicting it 100 years in the future. They're trying space travel for the first time, which obviously, you know, was done not that long after this film, you know, only sort of 30 years after this film was released. You know, at the time, going into space was complete fantasy. You know, I guess they thought it would be a long time before it was actually possible. I mean, obviously, in the film, war gets in the way. So, uh, I mean, they talk about it in the film, you know, there's a, they, two characters disagree on whether war, uh, you know, stops progress or, or actually increases progress. And I would say, I, I guess on one hand, you know, some technology would come out of war, you know, the, the need to sort of beat the enemy and create newer weapons and various other things. Uh, so from that side, it would advance some things, but obviously progress within societies is halted in a way. So when we're in the nine, we're in 1970, everyone still dresses and talks like they're in the 1940s. <laughs> but they probably, you know, but I mean, they would because you know because society wouldn't really advance because the world was so decimated, and space travel wouldn't have been something that they would have you know looked at. They were busy fighting a 25 year long war. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of much like in real life, you know, during the Second World War. I mean. So the Second World War, obviously, you got rockets, missiles, things like that. And, of course, that then led to us building rockets that went to space. And then the same with progress halting. I mean, I spoke about TVs. You know, we had TV. The TV was launched just before the Second World War, and then it was halted. They took it down. Um, so, you're, I mean, you know, progress does get halted uh, throughout wars. It was interesting that, actually, there was a, cause there's a helicopter in this film. And I read that the first helicopter was actually 1939, so while, you know, again, was this predicting the future? But then you kind of think, well, I'm sure that maybe was on the cards. So the, the film itself was made up of a lot of kind of, you know, visual artists and production designers. And uh, so you've got Alexander Corder and then his brother, Vincent Corder. He was a production designer. Um, the director himself, William Cameron Menzies, he had been a, a kind of visual art, a production designer in films before he became a director. 
So the film is kind of made up of artists and they also consulted a lot of avant-garde, for the future stuff, they consulted a lot of avant-garde kind of artists and architects and things like that. And if you think of avant-garde art, it's always a little bit futuristic anyway. Uh, things like, you know, Art Nouveau and things like that, like Metropolis as well, you know, that's very much got that all over it, that kind of art, that futuristic art look to it. And it's, it's, it's kind of ironic because H.G. Wells wrote this as a... He, ne he never liked Metropolis, he hated it. <laughs> uh, and he wrote this to be the kind of the opposite, almost like a reflection, a different reflection of, of that film. But then ironically, a lot of the designers on this film took from um, a lot of the artists and photographers in the Bauhaus group uh, we used and influenced this film, which is kind of ironic, I think, because H.G. <laughs> Wells himself didn't like that whole vision of that film. So a lot of those concepts in this film probably already existed to some degree. And, you know, the planes, these massive planes that they fly, there were, there is kind of art in the 20s when planes first came around that, that had those kind of similar designs that, that ended up in this film. The whole idea, I mean, there were people talking about, you know, skyscrapers, although skyscrapers hadn't, I mean, they did exist at that point, but these ginormous uh, skyscrapers and ginormous buildings were concept art. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, when they go deep into the future in this film, you can see films like Logan's Run in there, you know, living underground and the, <laughs> the weird clothes that they wear. I don't know when science fiction stops with, you know, now when you look at the, like a film like Blade Runner, <clears throat> the, cost, the, the gear that they're wear, wearing in Blade Runner kind of feels like things that we might wear now. I don't know at what point, it was kind of around the kind of 70s, wasn't it, where films stopped being outlandishly futuristic and started to become a bit more real. I suppose Blade Runner was maybe one of the first, because Star Wars still feels, <clears throat> although it's a, it's a very popular film, it still feels a little bit one foot in the 70s, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Whereas Blade Runner is a lot more realistic uh, future film, I think. It's interesting. I personally preferred that section, that kind of sat in that middle section of the film. I quite enjoyed where they were in that point. Mm. Um, and again, that felt quite like those because there was this this this, this, this virus. Essentially, they were talking about the Black Death. They were making mention of the Black Death, and then you had Ralph Richardson playing the boss, and then he had like this right hand woman as well, which was quite interesting. And she looked yeah. a bit. She, I can't remember her name in it, but she um, she kind of reminded me a bit of like Queen Boudicca. You know, she had the kind of look of that and this leader of a tribe. And that was quite interesting having a having a female character that was you know kind of leading a group, which was quite unusual maybe from 1936. And I felt that whole scene obviously you know we are living in a in a pandemic at the moment so that kind of felt a little bit similar similar to how what we're doing now yeah i just i thought that bit was quite interesting i found the future stuff maybe a, li a little bit too over the top personally i felt that you know that middle section went on a bit too long right because then we sort of jump all the way into the you know to the 2036 and it would have been nice to have seen i suppose there's another montage isn't there where we kind of see them building this new city and everything i thought it was going to be more but shorter sections so i was quite surprised at that sort of sent you know that middle portion went on quite as long as it did but i guess that was that that's kind of the main thrust of it isn't it is that they're trying to create this sort of new utopia that doesn't have war and i mean there's, there's kind of a theme about how far does humanity need to progress you know a character says can't we just have a rest and, and just enjoy life rather than having to constantly strive for new things and technology and pro you know progress the the species there's kind of arguments for both sides, you know, yes, it would be nice if everyone could just chill out and relax in a nice new utopia where there's no war or anything. But also, what is the point of existence if you're not striving to better the future for future generations? I mean, I think that the film maybe gets a little bit preachy, particularly the Raymond Massey's character. He's saddled with quite a few preachy speeches, isn't he? This is what's best for humanity, etc, etc. So we watched this film on Amazon Prime because we are... Still in lockdown, although yep. I think next week you come out of lockdown. I, however, I'm stuck in lockdown because I'm in... You're in an infected zone. <laughs> Just watch out for those of the wandering sickness. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. But there are none around here, controversially. Good. Yeah, so we are kind of sticking to films on Amazon Prime, and I think we'll probably do... Uh, all our Christmas films will be ones that are on Amazon Prime. So if you have Amazon Prime, obviously, you know, go and go and pick that up. Uh, but this has been released. Criterion have done it in America. They have, yeah. And yep. I think over here, is it Eureka? Network. Network, sorry, that's, yeah. Similar versions, I think. Obviously, one's Region A and one's Region B, so whatever flavour you can play. Uh, I mean, I think they've got different extras on them. From what I've read, the picture's slightly different. I mean, the, the picture quality on Amazon was pretty poor, 
I mean, obviously it is an old film, but there's loads of print damage and it wasn't very, you know, it's a bit fuzzy and the sound wasn't great. It's watchable, so if you've never seen it and you want to check it out, then by all means, you know, give it a go. And if you do enjoy it, then, yeah, I would recommend picking up either the Criterion or the Network Blu-ray, which, you know, from what I've read, you know, been nicely cleaned up and restored to probably look, you know, a hell of a lot better than that Amazon version. I mean, there is a colour version on Amazon as well. I've watched it for a few minutes just to see what it's like. It's, you know, it's as you expect. All the faces look a bit, they always have a little bit of a weird skin tone. Um, in these colourised versions so it's an interesting curio to look at but I, I would always rather watch the original black and white version if that's available the colourised versions always just look a little bit off and while we've mentioned threads it's not as nearly as depressing as threads <laughs> I did think it was going that way I was like why have we ch why have you chosen this for Christmas I know it starts at Christmas but Christ this is depressing but it's, it's not that depressing all the way through we didn't do a film we were going to do last time because we thought it was too depressing. And then yeah. when this one started, I was like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this isn't very Christmassy, is it? And then they, you know, and then you've got this sickness. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> this is all a bit too close to home. But no, it's not It's not as, you know, completely desperately depressing as Threads is. So that was Things to Come. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, let us know in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button over there. And don't forget to push the bell for notifications. There's other videos to check out over here. Come and find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and join us next week for another film.